were planning this workshop, as you all know, we called for um, some abstract, and some of them were so intriguing that we thought we wouldn't have them in a regular session if we'd pick them on a stage in a debate. And uh, here is our fabulous debating team. Uh, on my left, the absolutely lovely Sanjay and Albert team, and on my right, the confusingly Christoph and Chris team. <laughs> it's kind of like Chris, Christoph, some. You could, well, anyway, never. so moving on. Uh, I'm not really going to introduce them. Uh, Christoph works at IRC. Chris is an independent consultant. When they have wowed you with their opinions, go and talk to them at the dinner. They're really fantastic, interesting. We're going to debate a motion. Um, this house believes that uh, universal access to water and sanitation is both essential as a target and achievable. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, the team on my left. Then we're going to hear an alternative view from the team on my right. Both teams have got some seconds. It's not like in a duel, you know, there's no pistols or anything, but they have a second to kind of reinforce the argument. Then I'm going to take a few questions from the floor. These people are highly, you know, sophisticated, intelligent, top people in the sector, so please don't ask people <coughs> questions. It's such a waste of time. So I'm looking for your really, really pointed, nasty questions, okay? You know, don't want them, don't want them to have too many of your time before they glass of wine. Uh, and then we'll ask each team to just wrap up, and then if they haven't come to some sort of amicable schmoozy agreement, um, we'll, we'll have a little vote and see whose ideas you really, really think are the top ideas. Okay? Happy? Ready? It's a debate. It's tight on time. So I would invite Sasha to open the up. Okay. Um, do I sound as funny as Barbara. And, and thank you, thank you, thank you, Barbara, and thank you to Christoph for um, coming and taking part in this. This is, um, I think, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And thank you to you, to, to your people for, for being here. Um, so, just a little story. Um, in September last year, I was at this. Um, this big kind of MDG event. I, I get to carry the bags of important people to these kind of things. So I can, I can um, actually get in there and, and see how they operate. Um, and it was, it was kind of former presidents and CEOs and uh, uh, heads of agencies and so on. And they were talking about the MDGs. And they were talking about the MDGs and what should succeed them. Um, and one of the most inspiring and, and, and noteworthy um, kind of interventions was from um, Mark Malik Brown, and he was the head of UNDP, and he was also uh, one of the chief architects of the MDGs. And he said basically, "Look, um, you know, you guys are at the most exciting time in terms of human development. When we were doing the MDGs, we never really thought that you know there, that poverty could be um, eliminated." Um, you know, we just thought it's a fact of life. We never thought that these goals were achievable. And here you are, just 12 years later, and you're actually, you know, really thinking about finishing these tasks off. You're really thinking about the end of poverty. You know, that's, that's a sea change. That's, that's completely changing perceptions, parameters, assumptions. So the reason I, I mention that is that it's, it, it's not just that those words are inspiring. But it's also that they are true. Uh, we heard Jamie this, this morning in his keynote talk about the advances that have been made. Um, we, we more than half poverty. We um, reduced child mortality from about 12 million to about 7 million uh, deaths per year. We uh, 2.3 billion people have gained access to, to drinking water. Um, things like gender parity in primary education, things that were unthinkable just 10 years ago, are, are, more, are more or less um, online to be achieved. So what this shows is that, um, and, and the reason I mention it, is that it, it, it shows that when progress is made, the assumptions that we make and the models we build have to change. And, and we can do things that appear unthinkable. But it also means that there is a huge value in setting targets um, that are achievable and yet very, very ambitious. And that's why um, Almut and I are supporting um, this motion that universal access is possible and that we do need to set targets accordingly. Now, there are three main reasons for this. 
The first is that many countries have already achieved this. So if they've done it, it is possible. Um, you know, in North America, in Europe, dare I say in Australia, they have, they have done it, and it's, it's not right to say that they can do it and other countries cannot. Now, the key thing to this is that countries have done it in, in different ways and in different time frames. Um, and the, the, the political decisions, the trade-offs that they've made um, are, are very different and unique to them and difficult to explain with very rational kind of assumptions and models. Um, take the case of the, United, of the United Kingdom, for example. Um, about 150 years ago, in the late 19th century, uh, all the sewage coming out into the Thames stopped the parliament from functioning. So basically, poor sanitation affected the urban elites. So the outcome of that is huge investments in sewage. So that's not a kind of a, a, a rational uh, progression. Nevertheless, it's big change and it's big positive change for reasons that are not necessarily the ones that we kind of put forward. The second reason is that access to water and sanitation is a human right. Um, and that may sound a little bit fluffy and so on, but if you buy into that value system, you do have to then set your targets accordingly, which means that everybody has to have access and no one can be left behind. Of course it takes time to do that, and it's, it's over a period of time, it's progressive, but nevertheless you have to start off by uh, on, the, on the assumption and on the working model that that is what you want to achieve. The third reason is that setting these targets and achieving them are not just a moral imperative, but they are kind of enlightened self-interest. And, and let me explain that a little bit more. Um, in, in about three, four years ago in UNICEF, we looked at, um, in health, um, at the impact of focusing on the poorest people. Um, and based on our analysis of four countries where, the, where child mortality was high, um, what we found out was that uh, focusing on the poorest quintile would mean that we would, we would, be, we would get much greater cost effectiveness. So it, it would increase um, the lives saved per dollar spent now, the lives saved in 2015 per dollar spent now, from 75 to 125 lives saved. Now, Unfortunately, in, in, in water and sanitation, we do not have enough of a grasp on costs of interventions to do that kind of calculation. But what Rick Reingens and Ollie Cumming did um, for the SHARE Consortium is they looked at um, household data and looked at the benefit side of the, of the equation. And they looked at provide, what would happen if you focused, uh, provided full sanitation coverage for individual quintiles. And what they found was that providing sanitation for the poorest quintile would provide you with 2 to 17 times the benefits of providing uh, full coverage to any of the other quintiles. So, and, and there are spillover effects. Providing sanitation for the poorest is actually beneficial for the other quintiles as well, positive externalities. So what that means is that Focusing on the poorest, quite often it's argued, costs more, and therefore that is why we can't achieve the last little bit. But actually, the, the, the evidence is that it's more likely to be cost-effective if we were to do that. So the question is, how do we do it? Not why do we do it or whether we should set targets, but how do we do it? And we know that incredible progress can be made. We, we know that Thailand went from about 1% to about 98 or 99% sanitation coverage in about 40 years, way quicker than, than most European countries. We know that Ethiopia has more than halved um, open defecation over the last 12 years. We know that Africa, quite often our story is negative on sub-Saharan Africa, but they have provided, over the last 12 years, 50,000 people with drinking water every single day. That's about a quarter of its current population. So fast progress is possible, but we do know that you reach, a, or many countries reach a point at about 80 or 90% coverage where they do slow down. 
And a lot of that is put down to, well, it's about physical access, it's about the hardest to reach, and so on and so forth. But one of, and, and that may be true to some extent, but one of the primary reasons is that you need a system of government that feels accountable for delivering on those 10%. Or the, the reason why that 10% um, don't get services and, ac- and access so quickly is because no one cares. And I think that is the trick in terms of the enabling environment. Having some kind of uh, accountability system in the, in, in, in the governance system that means that those last few people do matter. Then different countries will take different uh, processes to achieve that. So what we're saying is that it is possible. Uh, it's not just possible, but it's desirable to target universal access. And it shouldn't be just our lack of ambition that stops us from achieving it. Okay, I give the floor to Christoph um, and his lovely assistant. (laughs) Poster girls. Um, Sanjay, you disappoint me because I wanted to say you were wrong and you didn't say anything wrong. So, I'm disappointed. But (laughs) I think everyone forever is and everywhere is a very clear and good aspiration. And I think... Should we do it? I think nobody doubts about it. Can we do it? I think if we couldn't, I wouldn't be so happy to work in this sector. But the question is, how should we do it? And I think when we talk about everyone forever, the problem is that this very simple message actually hides quite a lot of complexity that we once in a while talk about but not really acknowledge or deal with. And so... Um, we worked a bit on it, and I, I want to show a bit what we did. Sorry, can't turn too much my head. Um, I worked for 10 years as technical, uh, in the tec- technical advisory group of the GMP and looked a lot at the data. And when we started to look at the data, we were a bit surprised that we had this big increase of people that actually got access, but percentage-wise, still there was a decrease. And we didn't take long to find out that it had to do something with population increase. And so... I might just invite your poster girls, if they can do it safely, to just walk along the front, actually, so everybody can see them. <laughs> this could be very exciting. So try and keep it spread out and walk... Yeah, so, oh, so basically... Very good. <laughs> basically, what you see is three graphs in which the, uh, the number of people that actually get access increases, but still the percentage uh, decreases or stagnates. And when we think a bit longer about it, the thing is that if the middle graph, it stays equal. And so what you have is you have 60%, for example, that year over year is the same. That seems like a static figure. But in reality, what you have is you have people coming up the ladder, you have people down, and this is kind of a dynamic equilibrium. And when you talk about the dynamic equilibrium, that means that you have to understand what is happening. And so we went a little bit further, and the Poster girls will have to come back slowly back. <laughs> and I have to warn because the next poster has some kind of very explicit maths. And I know some people find that really shocking. So what we did is we looked at other sectors that look at models. And so what we used is the CIR model, which is susceptibility, infection, and uh, recovery. And started to look at it. And what we looked at is, could we use that same model for sanitation? And so the uptake of sanitation, work done by Mimi Jenkins, is, uh, is partially by people talking to each other and convincing. You can have social marketing to get on the ladder. But you also have, uh, for example, people that cannot financially afford and fall off the ladder. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> I need to see this as well, right? <laughs> And so, and, and it could be a bad experience. And that bad, bad experience, we found that actually when we talk about slippage, the, the kind of people falling off, that there's two kinds of them. There is what we call in our little expose good slippage, people that really want to go back on it. 
and bad slippage, people that actually are less keen to have it, bad experience. And so on the next poster, we started to do an, a model that was a little bit more complex because people in, in different areas do not have the same probability of getting on or off. And so we started to model, and then we got a bit of surprising emergence. And it was that once you get higher coverage figures, even if you push very hard to have a higher probability of people getting on the ladder, which is the yellow one, there is no huge increase of people getting there. But on the other hand, when you have that slippage and you start to tinker a little bit with the slippage, you get really uh, big differences. And it's a bit like a bucket with a hole in. If you want to fill, keep a bucket full with a hole in, you can either pour in water and water water in, or you can start to fill the hole and stop the hole and stop that slippage. And we found that slippage has a huge effect, particularly the one that has a bad slippage, has a disproportionate effect on your coverage figures. So, little first girls, next one. <laughs> but the thing is, this thing, this thing is still an oversimplification of the whole question. Because it's not that people have access or not access. There is different stages. We have this sanitation ladder. And so people don't fall off or go on the ladder. They go stage up, stage down, and so on. And when we, when we started to do, look at that, what we found is that a lot of this triggering can actually create an artificial equilibrium. And I think very often in projects, because you're doing very intense activities, your coverage figure seems to be bigger than they really are. And so you have this natural equilibrium where a lot of your projects fall back to afterwards. And so what we say is that if you don't have people wanting more sanitation or people leaving sanitation less even if you have a high coverage, you slowly go back to that natural equilibrium. And that happens also with uh, some of the mass sanitation projects. We, we use mainly sanitation as in this example. So where am I in my whole discourse? <laughs> so we think that everyone forever is a clear aspiration. There's no doubt about it. And I think it is something that is achievable. But we think that we have to think a bit smarter about bringing um, all the little puzzle pieces that different people are working on, the, the, the financial one, the governance one. All these little things have to be going on, and we have to stop saying, like, look, this piece of puzzle is far more important than this puzzle. It, it just has to fit all together. And there are means that have been used in other sectors to, to start looking at this in a more holistic and smarter way. So the message is not that it's complex and it's not going to happen. I think... The message is more like we have to think and look at other people how, in other sectors how they have dealt with this kind of complexity and start to use this kind of techniques to our advantage. Thank you, Christoph. <laughs> and, and thank you very much to our poster ladies. Um, it's quite hard to get people in the sector not to use PowerPoint. I have to say I picked the four best people, but they were very persuasive on other methods. Um, Almut. Yes, um, funny voice again, okay. Um, and I was going to use a really convincing argument that I actually didn't see the posters and then you gave them to me, damn it. So, <laughs> can't use that one. I was also going to say that, you know, I'm, I'm an economist by training and I'm actually a really lousy one. The last thing I do understand is models. And I had a hard time in university understanding models. For me, they only were usable once I had real data and could sort of learn by looking at real cases, understanding hyperinflation. I didn't understand the model, but when I studied what happened in Brazil, I finally got it. So you need to bear with me on that aspect, because I am going to say something like, what does that mean and help me in real life in the discussion with policymakers? I do, I do agree and understand that models are very useful, and, and, but, they, but they carry you only so far in in public policy, and I think you come to a point where um, political decision-making is really not necessarily rational. And discussions on slippage I find difficult because I do feel we have so little real-life data, especially long-term data, that we all seem to be talking out of our anecdotal uh, pots and pockets here and there. 
there are a few studies, and I've actually voted for the poster out there um, of the, the plan study on, on uh, open defecation, uh, long-term sustainability of open defecation. And that study is, is, is really very interesting, so I encourage people to read the poster, if not vote for it. Um, I'm not getting paid anything for that. Um, <laughs> But the point I wanted to make, so that study looked at um, how much are, in, I think in four West African countries, and Paul is in a much better position to tell all the details, but into, uh, into whether communities remain open defecation free after a minimum of two and a half years. And then we did a study, WSP, in 2012, I believe in Bangladesh, that looked at, again, um, union parishads that had been declared open defecation free five years before that. And the you get data, and so for example, in the Bangladesh study it came out, 89% um, of those communes were, in fact, still open defecation-free, and 10%, there was about 10% slippage. Now, is 10% bad or good? I don't know. I really can't say whether these figures help me in deciding what to do about it. Um, we had, a few years ago, actually here at the, at the last event, um, we had a training on uh, rural sanitation, and somebody raised the question, what's your um, success rate uh, after triggering so and so many thousand villages in Indonesia? And we said it was about 35%. And half the room went like, oh, that is so low. You're not getting to 100%? I was like, what dreamland are you in? And the other half was saying, well, 35% seems reasonable. So I can't, I don't know what bad or good slippage is. I don't know what the data shows you, and maybe you have data for it, but I, I really don't know what to do with that, with the model even. I don't know what, um, you know, and, and I, I do understand that after triggering, you get higher rates than maybe afterwards, but it, I think we have also seen enough cases where that isn't the case. So I don't want to sound as if there is no slippage at all. I think there is, but how important is it and how how much can we with confidence say that the data shows us this or that? I think that's still very anecdotal. Um, and then I think um, we need to also distinguish perhaps a bit, and we talked about, you talked more about sanitation, but I think between water supply and sanitation, there's a big difference. I, I think water supply, I would even agree with you more that um, systems no longer functioning are probably a bigger issue and we have even less data on that, and we need more to really understand what needs to be done, especially on rural water schemes. I think that that's very important. So I think when I read your summary page, actually, I was like, agree, 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 sort of agree, agree. Most of it was actually fine, um, which I, it's probably not what Barbara's intention was of this debate. So I think we agree on that the how is important, not the weather. I think that's it. I would argue that the how is no longer the same totally open question that we maybe had a few years ago. I do think there are countries, including Thailand, including Bangladesh, that actually have, have shown amazing progress. And I think especially Bangladesh, with the high rates of, the lo very low rates of open defecation, but it puts other countries uh, at least in a difficult situation, if not to shame, that that are at a higher level of, of GDP and consider themselves quite more advanced and haven't reached that. So I think there are cases where we can see somehow the how is better understood now, and we have more cases. I think Sanjay was very right to point out some of this is very context-specific. Vietnam is doing well uh, for good reasons, you know, very strong women's union, doing a lot of really fantastic work. Every country, Thailand had a king, you name it. But the bottom line, I think, of the story is that these countries were able to harness those special qualities they had in order to make progress quite fast and get very far. And they came to a point where slippage wasn't even a discussion anymore. I don't think Thailand discusses slippage. I don't think Chile has discussed slippage or Argentina. These are all countries that are at 99%. I do consider 99 actually more or less done deal. Sorry, there's still a 1%, but I mean, there, there, 99 or, or 100, I'm, I, you know, there, there is a point where it's, it's, it's just not um, nomadic tribes and this and that. It's, it's going to get very, very difficult. Um, I do agree, though, also with the fact that you were saying, you know, getting people just onto the ladder isn't enough, and I think that's very important to look at. So I do think, um, in summary... 
I think there are a number of things that we actually agree on. I'm just trying to figure out how your model is going to help in terms of getting this across to policymakers. And so Chris is apparently going to help Chris me understand is that better. Answer that question for you, Alex. Very Thank good. You. Very Thank you very much. <laughs>